Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here to our <clears throat> budget uh, agenda for this morning and until we get uh, finished. I apologize for this voice. You're going to get sick of my voice today. The good news is I won't talk too much. Thank you, Councillor Walls, for your support. So I'm going to uh, get right to the agenda. <coughs> I have a resolution by Wells, seconded by Black, that the agenda be approved as presented on the blue sheet in front of you. Any discussion? Those in favor? That is carried, so we will follow the agenda as given to us by our clerk. I can tell you that Councillor Height will not be with us today, and I'm not sure where Councillor Columbus is, whether he will be here or not. I haven't heard, so we'll, we certainly have more than enough to proceed. There's no cold closed session this morning. Normally at a uh, budget session, I have a few words to say, but as I told you, I'm not going to talk too much, so I'm not going to uh, say anything at this point. We'll get right to item four, our presentations. And having said that, I'd turn this right over to our treasurer, Mr. Johnson, please, to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first annual Levy Supported Operating Budget Overview and Economic Outlook. Hopefully we will uh, have a good uh, uh, session today and uh, continue it uh, on an annual basis. Uh, this is a, uh, a new thing for uh, the Finance Department in Norfolk County to do with Council regarding the budget. Um, you will be presented information, uh, I, I believe in the history of Norfolk County, unless I'm, I'm wrong, uh, the, the earliest the Council, this is the earliest the Council would receive any any financial information before our levy uh, operating budget. Uh, but I would like to um, um, caution or, or let Council know that this is all very preliminary information. Uh, the only thing that I can guarantee is that the numbers will change uh, when we do go to uh, our January uh, budget deliberations. Um, I would like uh, to ask that this be an informal uh, meeting. Uh, so much so I'm taking my tie off. There we go. <laughs> the <laughs> well, Andy has a tie on. I think he should take his off too, but that's up to him. <laughs> uh, he does. He does. So, the <laughs> well, it is televised, so that is it. Um, so throughout the presentation, I encourage council to ask questions. Uh, do not wait till the end. Uh, we want this to be an open discussion. Uh, we encourage questions and feedback uh, throughout the process. Um, I do not see your hand holler at me. Wake me up. So interrupt at any time, but just holler at me. Thank you, James. Um, also, I have uh, no idea how long this will take today, uh, but I do know we are having lunch, which is excellent. Uh, so uh, just to keep that in mind. Um, so there's a couple slides that I'd like to go through and then I'm going to turn it over to the One Fund Investment Group. So the overview of today's meeting, uh, well, I'm going to do an introduction on why we're here. Um, it, there was a resolution done uh, in March uh, that uh, asked for um, in, uh, to look at the budget process and, and this is part of it. Uh, there will be a presentation by uh, the MFOA and the One Fund uh, Investment Group on our One Fund performance. Uh, Chris Baird, our General Manager of Development and Cultural Services, will be doing an economic uh, outlook, and it's very specific to Norfolk County. Then uh, Kathy, Cindy, and myself will be going through uh, some slides related to our uh, operating budget, uh, an overview of the budget process. Uh, we'll be going through the budget drivers, uh, the significant budget drivers, and also hopefully we'll have some discussion with SLT on those drivers, uh, and we'll have some statistics as well. 
And then uh, at the end, there is an action item that uh, was on the action item list related to the actuarial review of self-insurance reserve funds, and that will affect our budget in January. So uh, there's a memo uh, on that that will be presented. And then, of course, at the end and during the process, questions, discussion, feedback is welcome. So why are we here? Well, we could blame Councillor Black if we want. Uh, however, uh, we are here because of a council-approved motion on March 14th, 2017 that was moved by Councillor Black and seconded by uh, Councillor Oliver. More specifically, we won't get into reading all of that, uh, that Council's direction that uh, directs staff to investigate budget processes and present options for alternative processes and enhancements. So <laughs> the alternative processes, today's overview and economic outlook. This is, uh, I believe this is unprecedented for Norfolk County. Uh, the second uh, process that we would like to do, uh, economic factors, presentation in advance of budget deliberations instead of uh, bringing all that information to you all at once. Uh, significant budget drivers identified early uh, of the budget deliberations. Um, also, advanced preliminary overview of new budget initiatives. So we will have a, a few slides with our, our, we call them NBIs for short, and they're ranked from one to four, and uh, you will be seeing those. Also, an advanced look at your council approved initiatives that you've done throughout 2017. Uh, so, as you know, various reports come to Council uh, with some initiatives and uh, the debate is done throughout the year and it's to be added on to the 2018 budget. So we will list those ones out for you. Uh, and then also we're giving you an advanced uh, review or overview of the budget process so you understand what, what, uh, is, uh, what happens to get to this point and also all the, the efforts that happen to, to get to the January deliberations. And then of course uh, something that we're also doing a little bit different this year is uh, presentations and we will be having a one fun presentation today. And then also um, we can discuss items today in advance uh, before the, the January uh, budget. For example, um, the one of the uh, the bills that are coming down deals with minimum wage increases and we have some slides that uh, Mr. Slichenkov will be presenting related to that because that is an important part of this budget. That kicks in in July of 2018, January 2018. I'm only half off. So I will hand over the remote to the one fund I hope not. <laughs> uh, good morning. While we're waiting, I, I would probably think that you're Donna. I'm Donna. Yes, I, I am. Uh, <laughs> pretty sharp guy, aren't I? Uh, do you, if you would like to introduce sure. the rest uh, of the crew, thank you. All right. I will do so. Um, I want to start by thanking Norfolk uh, Council for having us here today and providing us with the opportunity to uh, provide this update. Um, I'm Donna Harridge. I'm with I'm the manager of accounting and corporate services with MFOA, Municipal Finance Officers Association, and I have 23 years municipal experience with the city of Mississauga. Joining me today is Kelly Rogers. She is with Rogers Investment Consulting, as well as uh, Brian Holland, who's with Guardian Capital. And you will see their roles as I explain some of the things as we go through today. I also want to extend the regrets of Calvin Barrett with MFOA. He unfortunately had a conflict and was unable to make it today. I want to start off by going through the agenda quickly. Uh, I want to start off with a bit of an overview about the One Investment Program as well as some background about the Norfolk County Legacy Fund. I want to talk a little bit about the performance and introduce a concept to you called the endowment model. This is, we view this as part of the evolution of your investment strategy. We're going to talk a little bit about the background of some equities and then talk about next steps. 
Since 1993, the Association of Municipalities Ontario, through their LAS subsidiary, and Municipal Finance Officers Association, MFOA, through CHUMS, have partnered to provide municipal investment opportunities for the municipal sector. In addition to the association boards, the highest standard of care is provided to the One Investment Program through two advisory committees. The first one is the Peer Advisory Committee. On that is seven municipal finance professionals. They provide the municipal perspective. This is also mirrored with the invest by a six-member investment advisory committee. It's headed up by a lawyer and has five municipal has five investment experts in institutional. What I mean by that is they, their primary experience has been with pension, for example, pension and investment funds, insurance funds. Today, almost 104, over 141 municipal investors participate in the One Investment Program, and the balance totals $1.7 billion. Our day-to-day -day investing is actually done through our professional portfolio managers, MFS, and Guardian Capital, and that's the role that Brian plays. You might be familiar in your personal life with financial planners or stockbrokers. A portfolio manager is different. When they want to make day-to-day -day investment advice, they don't call us and ask them if they can do so. We provide, the One Investment Program provides them guidelines and framework, and what they do is they make the investment decisions that's in our best interest. They have a very high fiduciary level of care to do what's best for the One Investment Program. In addition, we have an independent oversight through uh, Rogers uh, Investment Consulting, and that's the role that Kelly plays. So what she does is she basically makes sure that our portfolio managers are doing their job. I'm not going to go through a lot of detail, but Norfolk County and the One Investment Program have been working together for about the last three to five years in order to make this program work. I want to bring a couple of things to, your highlight, to highlight for you. The first one is we were involved in the development of your initial investment policy. We also help providing the guidelines and allocations of your investments. Finally, on an ongoing basis, we provide monthly performance reports on how the Norfolk Legacy Fund is doing. In August of 2014, Council made the decision to invest the proceeds of the hydroelectric utility sale with the One Investment Program. That totaled $67.7 million. During 2015 and 2016, $2 million was withdrawn from the fund. Today, that, or as of the end of October, that fund totals $70.1 million. Included in that total is actually a provision for your hospital of a million dollars, as well as a retention reserve of a half million dollars. That reserve is being set aside to deal with fluctuations in the value of the market value of your investment. Thank you, Donna. I get to take over now. Um, and as James said earlier on his, I, any questions you have, feel free to uh, stop me and better to get them answered when they arise rather than wait to the end, because I'll probably have forgotten the answer by then. Okay, uh, if we can interrupt you, I didn't know whether that would be the process. Are you okay with that? Absolutely. I would like to start the questions by looking at the slide that is on the screen. And if I'm reading this correctly, that balance of $70.1 million as of last month, are you telling me that's the current balance in our 67.7 investment, or is that the total, yes. including the money that we have withdrawn? No, that's the balance. It might be off by a few cents because we're now into November, but as of October 31st, 2017, the balance of your um, investment of the legacy fund was $70.1 million. Well, <clears throat> if I may, and then I'll go to Councillor Wells. My math tells me that from our initial investment of 
of 67.7, there is a, an extra amount of money, if I can call it that, uh, uh, interest uh, earnings. Well, that's the word I'm looking for, of approximately 2.4 million at the end of October. If I take the 67.7 initial investment from 70.1, is that a fair statement? Uh, yes, but the earnings have actually been greater than that because there's also been those two withdrawals. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm not worried about what we did in 15 or 16. Yeah. I'm worried about what has happened in 2017, and I believe the, the date is August the 31st. Yes. But you're talking here the end of October. Yes. So I'm going to go to Councillor Wells. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit better. So I hope we can keep on this trend. Councillor Wells. Thank you very much. Oliver Black. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, and just for clarification, um, during the presentation of this young lady here, she mentioned that we set aside $1 million, I believe, for the hospital and $500,000 for something else. Is that taken out of the $70 million or is it still in there? It's still in there. So we have not removed that? No, you have not. So if we take that, let's just roughly say $2 million out, we are at $68 million, if that were the case. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I can just clarify, it would be $1.5 million. Yeah. Okay. My math is not numbers. Okay, just give me a second. Okay, Councillor Oliver. Mr. Mayor, and my question just relates again. I'm looking at the withdrawal side of the chart, and in addition to the two million we've taken out annually to supplement our capital program, I know at least this last year, in other words, I guess it would be the investment year ending August of 2016, there was another amount of about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that I know our little advisory committee debated over the use of, and ultimately council allocated that to, to roads work. Now that was over and above the two million and yet you folks maybe aren't aware of that. So somehow or another, and again, it's not a big deal in the sense that it's money that's already been taken out and used elsewhere so the balance is what it is. But I just draw that to your attention. Thank you. Relative to the two items of two million each you've shown us. I, in fact, I think Mr. Mayor, I believe the previous year, the first year we had proceeds, there was about 100000 over and above the $2 million and over and above what went in the reserve. And then this last year, it was a larger amount of about 250000 That's my recollection, subject to being corrected. Thank you, Mayor Luke. Um, the point five million is again for what? It was a, is that the retention? Okay, so that's well, my figures. Say, uh, if I'm right here, sixty-seven point seven. We got nine hundred thousand dollars up. If you take all the math together, there take out the four million. We're nine hundred thousand ahead of two thousand and fourteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. My question to you is, what? During that time period, what were your fees? And are they they're excluded from these figures, are they correct? Correct. And what were they? Um, the fee, no, I believe the fees are, these figures are net of the fees. They are net of fees. So they, our fees have been taken, this is, these figures are net of fees. Okay, and what were your fees during that time period? Uh, the fees range uh, by 0.4 to 0.6%, depending on the product we are looking at. So depending on the investment vehicle, um, our bond is 0.4 of a percent. Our universal corporate bond is 0.45%. And our equity fund is 0.6%. I would have to go back and calculate based on the investment value. But I can do that. If you can give me a moment, maybe maybe what I can do is suggest Kelly uh, go and I can give you some rough estimates. And that'll be from 2014. Okay. It's inception, right? I can try and do my. Uh, there'll be rough numbers, but yes. Okay. Uh, James. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Councillor Brunton. Uh, there will be a comprehensive report coming to council. This is. It won't. 
the report that I would normally do with the subcommittee, uh, I will be bringing to council. Uh, I did not bring it today. It, it wasn't the right avenue to bring that report uh, for today. However, in that report, you will get some statistics uh, for the one fund, and included in those statistics are the fees. Uh, I have uh, I have more questions. I apologize. On this chart, September 14th to August 15th, right under initial investment, should that be August the 15th, 2015? Should that, is that the year from September 14th, 2014 to August 15th, 2015? Uh, yes, the initial investment came in in August of 2014. So the next line is from September 1 to August 31st, September 1 of 14 to August 31st of 15. And then same sep September 1 of 2015 to August 31st of 2016. And 17 and so on. What my difficulty is, <coughs> excuse me, we have always had at the end of the term August 31st of the year, we have always been given some time after that the rate of return in the amount that our investment has earned us for one year. And I can't determine that from the date of August 31st, 2016 to, I'm sorry, September 1st, 16 through to August 31st. In other words, I can't from this chart figure out what our rate of return has been the last year. Correct. And it's two slides on. I would like to on. know that if it's further in the package. Yes, away. Mr. Mayor, it's two slides because on. to be blunt, I'm having difficulty when I asked you if that's the current balance, 70.1, the answer was yes. The initial investment was 67.7. And I'm told that there's 2.4 of earnings left after we have taken out money for the hospital and the $2 million, uh, et cetera. Is that still a fair statement? The money for the hospital and the retention reserve has not been withdrawn from the account. It is still within that market value. Um, you can think of it as, because it's been designated for a particular purpose, you can think of it as restricted funds within that balance. So I think I have it now because I certainly didn't from the previous explanation. Out of the difference from the 70.1 and the 67.7, when you look at what we have transferred to a reserve, I'll just use that term, I don't know if it's financially correct, when you take that two million, there really is only left the 0.4 million. Whether it's 0.4 or someone else calculated 0.9. Well, 2.4 less two million is 0.4. It's less 1.5 million, Mr. Mayor. Okay, well, I'll, I'll wait because, you know, what we've transferred to the hospital and what we have taken out to put into our reserves, that's, that's done, it's gone. That money is set aside. I want to know what we've made in the last year and yes. what we have this council to decide where we're going to go with that and how much we have. That's, that's what I'm after. Okay. So that will come out? That, that dollar amount that you're looking for after the uh, reserve and after the allocations for the hospital would be $0.9 million. Um, James, a question to you is, <coughs> excuse me, is... One investment looking after the reserves, or are we transferring it that we look after? I think we made the decision that it would be left to get the higher rate, correct, with, re with the investment. Okay, thank you. Through you Continue. Mr. I'm sorry to That's just need to be clear. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, you are correct. And if I may, to, to answer Councillor Brunton's question a little bit more clearly, I, d I don't want Council to uh, imagine what the fees may be. Uh, in a dollar amount. So I just want to give an, a high level estimate uh, of the fees. You're looking at around $400,000 for fees for the one fund program. So just, I didn't, I know we gave some percentages and, and everything like that, but I just wanted to give you a perspective on what the fees are. 
Rob Brunton. Yes. In terms of the rate of return? Yes. Uh, your one year return at October, so 12 months ending October 31st, 2017, was 1.65%. And your annualized return since inception, so from September, September 14 to October 31st, 17, is annualized at 2.5%. Nine four percent. No, it was lower at the end. It was a, a lower return at the end of August. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brunton. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at, and, and James said it's around 400,000 since it started. Correct on the fees, or is that a one? What, what, what the 400,000 you refer to? Let's get an accurate figure from somebody. You will have that uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have an accurate figure. I haven't calculated them yet for the last year, but that 400,000 is an estimate for one year of fees. One year. Yes. Thank you. Very much, Kelly, for, for the questions. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So this shows what your asset mix is. The, um, you know, when Council made the decision and improved the investment policy in 2014, it was to have a target of 5% in cash and cash equivalents, which is in the high interest savings account, 37.5% in the bond. Uh, portfolio, which is a short-term bond portfolio, 37.5% in the universe corporate bond portfolio, and 20% in equity. So you can see that as of October 31st, uh, there's 1% in cash, 43% in bonds, 36.8% in the corporate bond, and 19.1% in the equity uh, portfolio. So 80% of your investments are in fixed income. Fixed income is highly dependent on interest rates. And we are currently in a very low interest rate environment. And as we all saw through the summer, the Bank of Canada has now started to raise rates after decades of declining rates. So that is very much a changed environment over the last six to nine months. This is the recent performance, as we indicated. So the legacy fund to 12 months to August 2017, the return was 0.4%. As of the 12 month return as of October, 1.65. Um, and if we go back to last December, the 12-month return was 3.16. The timing, the end date of when you measure performance can have a significant impact. And the Bank of Canada wrote, uh, raised rates twice in the summer, right before your August 31st end date, which caused bond prices to go down. Now here is a very complicated chart. This chart, uh, now, sorry, we're not, I'm, I'm trying to use the laser and uh, neither one of them seem to be working. Oh, this one does, but it doesn't carry far enough. So each of these vertical bars represents a 12-month return. 
So the first set of vertical bars is the uh, September 30th, 2014, or sorry, November 1st, 2014 to October 31st, 2015. Uh, the next one is November, sort of December to November. The next one is January to December, and it rolls on through to the far right, which is the most recent month end, October. And you can see the bond fund is in the blue. The corporate bond fund is in that sort of uh, red. The um, equity is in the gray. So you can see in the early, first early periods, uh, the equity fund had negative returns. Uh, but then it recovered, sorry, and the area, the green area, is your market value, your capital value. So when you look at the capital value, you can see there's been very little volatility. And you can also see by looking at the bars that in different periods, different asset classes or different investment options will outperform or underperform. The yellow line is your annualized return since inception. So, any questions on that chart? Councillor Brunton. Absolutely. We're going to address it in more detail later, but um, the, the proverbial blue chip securities, Canadian equities, shares of Canadian corporations that generate dividends, have track records like banks and insurance companies, and yeah. Sorry, go back one slide if you don't mind. We're only what in equities? Six, the no. Two slides. 20% in equities, yes. Now, are, uh, are we restricted on that? Your investment policy provides the restriction. Our, our uh, municipal or our? No. It's the municipal. You, uh, regulations allow you to invest in the one equity program. Norfolk County's investment policy says that your target weighting for equities will be 20% with a maximum allowed of 30%. So that's where we've made our mistake lately. Well. Thank you. Further, continue, Kelly. I wouldn't, if I may, I wouldn't characterize it as a mistake. It was an initial starting point as you moved into the process. Whether it's still an appropriate asset mix is a different question. Councillor Oliver, oh sorry. Okay, Councillor Oliver. Thank you, please. Mr. Mayor. I have to respond to my colleague. It's easy to say it was a mistake now on the right-hand side of the graph, Councillor. You look at the first 12 months of the graph and you look at those gray bars, they're all below the line. So it wasn't such a mistake at the time we came no. up with that. I think it was an appropriate initial position. Um, so what we need to do now is confirm your investment objectives. That you want to preserve capital for future generations and would like that adjusted for inflation so that the purchasing power continues to um, hold its value. You want to smooth out fluctuations in the amount of the annual withdrawal because it's very hard if it's all over the place from one year to the next. How do you do multi-year forecasting and multi-year budgeting? Um, you want to withdraw 2.5 million per year and have that amount indexed uh, so that every year you're drawing out more. Um, and that works out to 3.7% of the initial value indexed annually. And you want to manage the capital to achieve sustainable withdrawal levels. Is that a fair statement? OK. So the current approach to the legacy fund is, if we look on the left-hand side, in the left column, 
your withdrawal policy is a very short-term policy. Take out the money each year. In good years, put some in the retention reserve. In bad years, we'll just reduce the withdrawals. So that gives you volatility of withdrawals as opposed to reliable. So that's kind of in contra contrast to one of your objectives. You want to maintain a minimum floor of 6.7 million. So you have a one year time horizon for this portfolio from the withdrawal side. However, on the investment side, by including equities, albeit at a relatively small amount, you have a medium-term time horizon from the investment side. And yet, this is supposed to be a legacy fund. It's supposed to be forever, correct? Well, so it, could we at least say it has a time horizon of over 10 years? OK. Um, Normally what we do on a long-term investment, medium-term or long-term investment approach is a total return approach. So what we see here is that your withdrawal policy is one year, a series of 12-month periods or a one-year time horizon, but your investment approach is longer term. So we believe at one that these could be better aligned because they're not aligned now. And we would like to recommend that you consider the endowment model. Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the endowment model, but you set a withdrawal rate that can be sustained based on the investment portfolio's asset mix over the long term. You withdraw each and every year whether the portfolio value is up or down or sideways. You take that withdrawal every year. But in good years, where you earn more than you're withdrawing, you don't take that out. You let it accumulate, and you build it up so that, one, it provides a cushion when times get bad, or two, if it gets big enough, it allows an additional cushion that can be withdrawn for special projects or major plans. This is the model that, frankly, all large foundations, endowments follow um, because they have to disperse 3.5% of their endowed capital each and every year. Um, so through the tech bubble and tech wreck, they had to disperse 3.5. Through the financial crisis, they had to disperse 3.5. And this is a model that has been shown through history to work quite well for those kinds of situations. It's a strategy to manage volatility. Um, your initial withdrawal rate has been established at 3.7%. And that is sustainable over long periods of time, but only if you have a significant allocation to equities. Equities pay dividends, so cash flow comes in quarterly, um, but they're very volatile in short-term uh, time periods. So the next slide I'm going to show you, this was research that was done. It's based on US returns. Um, but it's consistent with what we see in Canada. This analysis was done on 30-year rolling time periods, beginning in 1926. So the first one is 1926 to 1956. The second period would be 1927 to 57, 28 to 58, 29, to 59. So it includes a period where equities went down 90%. It also includes the bear market of 63, 64. For those of you who might remember the expression, the nifty 50, and then the nifty 50 weren't so nifty anymore. Um, so what we, oh, someone gave me a pointer. Thank you. Okay, 
So uh, this is done, as I say, on U.S. data be using the S&P 500 and the Ibbotson long-term high-grade corporate bonds, so all investment grade. And what that shows us is that if your withdrawal rate is 3%, and that's your initial withdrawal rate is 3%, and then every single year it was adjusted for inflation, regardless of whether the portfolio value was up or down. You are sustainable. So at the end of 30 years, you'd maintained your inflation-adjusted value of the capital in 100% of the periods. At 4%, that's about 98% of those periods. At 5%, it's only 80%, and it declines as we go. The, red, or the blue bar is a portfolio of 50% equities and 50% bonds. The red bar is 75% equity and 25% bonds. Not, please don't take it that we're suggesting anywhere near that aggressive. But what this does show is the higher your withdrawal rate, the more aggressive you have to be on the investment side. Um, a 3.7% withdrawal rate is not an aggressive withdrawal rate. Um, it would be a typical withdrawal rate for a balanced portfolio. So what does this mean for no Norfolk County? We're now going to show you some hypotheticals. These are based on the actual one fund returns over the last decade. Um, and this was beginning, just the beginning of the 2008 uh, financial crisis. And this is with your current asset mix, as outlined in your policy. If you had begun 10 years ago, you would see that the first six or seven months were not good. You would have fallen below your 67.7. But within 12 months, you would have recovered it all. After the first year, you take your first withdrawal of 2.5 million, the 2 million that is identified in your policy, plus the 500,000 allocation to the hospital. So it's a, the real withdrawal is 2.5. And that withdrawal has been adjusted annually. And you would see that at the end of it, uh, you would be receiving an annual payment of approximately 2.85 million. Um, and you would have preserved the original capital of 67.7 million. What you would not have done is been able to preserve the purchasing power, the inflation adjusted amount. So I just quickly went on the Bank of Canada's website yesterday to their inflation calculator. I wasn't going to sit down with a spreadsheet and figure it out, so I just asked them to tell me. And the inflation adjusted value of that original 67.7 million would now be 70.4 million. So if you had invested, however, in a 50% equity and 50% fixed income, and these are using the actual returns from each of the one portfolios, well, the first year would have been really bad. Nobody would have been happy because you were starting at the beginning of 2008, right when, just a few months before the markets and the financial crisis hit and equities declined. But if you followed the endowment model and made your first withdrawal and then continued to index your withdrawal, you would see that it recovered. By halfway through, you had been making your annual withdrawals and your capital value is now well above your initial value. Um, at September 30th, 2017 in this, the capital value was 75 million. The inflation adjusted value of the original capital was 70.4 million. So with 50% equities and 50% fixed income, 
you would have maintained the value of your original inflation adjusted capital you would have taken that 2.5 million indexed annually each year and you would have approximately a $5 million cushion. Yes? Mr. Brunton? Um, you keep referring back to 2008. We, we got into this one fund in what, 2014? My, yes. Yeah, okay. I just want clarification. Yes, we're going back 10 years to show, one, a really bad market. Right. And how it impacts, and longer term. Right. A so that gives us a 10-year history. Thank you. Okay. James? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Kelly, I don't want to put you on the spot, but this is a question as treasurer I get every once in a while, especially with the last year of return that we had. It was a 0.4% return. And the, the comment that is that is out there is, well, if we would have put that in a GIC, we would have had a better return. So I would like you to answer that question if you don't mind. Okay. I have to jump ahead. If you'll go to slide 22. Uh, the average GIC five-year G... Sorry, numbers in the top right-hand corner at the sorry. home bar. That's some of them still looking, so it's just right up in the top right-hand corner. Top right-hand corner, page 22, it's at the top of the brown bar. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's fine. The average five-year GIC since October of 2010 has yielded 1.9%. The average five-year GIC at September 30th, 2017 was yielding 1.63%. So on one individual discrete period of September 1 to October October 31st, yes, a one-year, a five-year GIC would have performed better. But your average annualized return over the three years is two point, what was it, two? Yeah. So, uh, yes, it's an excellent point. You can pick out individual periods where one particular investment will perform better than another, but we're looking at an overall portfolio. So if I can just go back. The final one we wanted to show you here was 40% fixed income, 60% equity. And this would be very typical for a pension fund, an uh, endowment, you know, hospital foundations, charitable organizations. Um, your cushion, again, the same withdrawals, again, the same pain in the first few years, but at the end, after the 10-year period, the market value would have been uh, $80 million. So providing you a $10 million cushion over the inflation adjusted value. So yes, equities are volatile. They bounce up and down. However, they do earn more over the long term. Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, I understand exactly what you're saying, but it, should, a, should an investor, let's say like Norfolk County, take your advice to heart and choose to increase the equity portion of the portfolio, aren't we supposed to buy low with sell high? So we would be buying at a time when the equities are higher and therefore more expensive to buy into, correct? Absolutely. So you'd have to time when you choose to change the mix of your portfolio. Um, I wouldn't suggest using the term time. What you would do would be lay out a schedule and do it in tranches. Figure out where you want it to be and then set out a schedule knowing that if the market corrects 10%, you might accelerate that schedule. A year ago, if you'd asked any investment professional, they'd be saying, 
Well, yeah, equities are pretty richly valued right now, but brands are pretty overvalued too. Well, here we are a year later, equities are up on the year, and we're saying equities are pretty richly valued. Um, so we try not to time the market, because I don't know about you, but my crystal ball is pretty cloudy these days. But if we set out a schedule of tranches, which would be what we would recommend, and then if the market goes on sale and gives us an opportunity, say it corrects 10%, you would accelerate those tranches. Okay? So, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, did you have... Well, another line of thought is, too, I certainly understand and agree that if you look at a 10-year, or in here I think you're looking more at a 20 or 25, uh, that there is some uh, certainly merit, a lot of merit in saying, if you f take your withdrawal every year at a fixed rate, say 2.5 million, as you suggest, you can count on that every year, but you also should in 10 years or whenever have uh, a little more of a nest egg there. I agree. One of the things that we have recognized as a council, I believe, is that right now our reserves are pretty pathetic, and I hate to use that word, but they're not too flush, many of them in the negative. So I guess if we have a good year, we kind of sort of rub our hands and say, here's a chance to start really making an impact on our reserves. Having said that, I know when you withdraw, you're, you're forfeiting future and return. So I think it's a philosophy, but yeah. certainly this type of portfolio, if I may, is very common, I think, with people who have some money to invest for retirement, where every year they can, they can plan on what every month is going to go from investment yeah. into checking account or wherever. Is that fair? It's an excellent an analogy. So, you know, we all spend our working lives saving up for retirement. And then when we enter retirement, it's sort of, okay, well, I'm not getting a paycheck anymore, so I've got to start paying myself from my investment portfolio. And we withdraw money. And if the markets go way up, we have a great bull market, we don't say, oh, good, I get to triple my spending this yeah. year. Um, we just let it ride because we know at some point in the future, we're going to have some bad years. So we build up that cushion for those bad years. And when it gets to the point that we're not even spending the income or we've got such a big cushion, yeah, maybe we take some extra money out and we buy a new car. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. A couple of things on that page 22 I was looking at. And, I, uh, and I'm a little, I, I must apologize. I'm not that familiar with the PPN. I do, I have learned a lot lately. And, but you buy a portfolio, and, but they don't actually invest in that portfolio. What do they do with the money? If we put $2 million into a PPN, okay, and it's a 10-stock portfolio, what do they actually do if they don't buy those shares? What do they do with that money? Whatever they think they can make more money at. The issuer of the PPN, yeah. um, they might put some of it in those stocks. Yeah. They might put, say, 70% of it in those stocks. Yeah. And the other 30%, they're going to invest in other things. Um, or they might obtain the exposure to the underlying index through the use of derivatives. Yeah, well, the uh, reason I'm asking that, we have a PPN and the Conservation Authority and it's basically done horrible. But, uh, yeah. I won't get into that, but my other question, if I may, um, you know, you talked about equities, and if we, uh, you know, if we, we invested more in equities, it doesn't matter about the principal, to me, if you get the right stocks would pay the good dividend, and we withdraw those dividends, like, we'd be laughing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So, oh, too many pieces of technology. So this chart, you're probably going to find it easier to see on your individual screens. Um, but this just talks about the volatility of equities. So if your time horizon is short, is one year, when we go back to from the period from January 1956 to October 2017, 
27% of those whirling one-year periods had negative returns, total of 730 individual periods. But if we go out and look at the three-year, because we've, been, we've had time working with us, uh, there were a total of 706 periods. There were negative returns in 11% of them. Going out to five-year periods, 682 periods, there were negative returns in only 2.2% of those periods. But more importantly, when we go out to seven years, there were no negative periods. There was no seven-year negative period from January 1956 to October 2017. So that captures the 63-64 uh, bear market, the financial crisis. It misses, it doesn't include the depression, but we covered that one, or the Great Depression, but we covered that one earlier. So th there's an expression that some people quote, I don't normally use it myself, but it's, it's not about timing of the market, it's time in the market. And the reason for that, and to um, uh, Councillor Brunton, dividends. Dividends form two-thirds of the total return. So as individuals, we, when we retire, we take the dividends out, and that's what we live off of. But in an endowment-type portfolio, you're just reinvesting those dividends. So when we look at the long-term returns, compounded annualized long-term returns, two-thirds of that long-term return comes from the dividend. Um, and it's, but they do provide that cash flow which makes it possible to follow the endowment model. So, there's only two ways, Norfolk County, under the current regulations, there are only two ways that Norfolk County can obtain any kind of equity exposure. One is through the one equity program, and the other is through principal protected notes that are tied to an equity index. So I wanted to take you through an example of an actual PPN. This was issued by Barclays, it's a point-to-point -point note, issued October 20th, 2017, or 2010, matured October 20th, 2017. In the prospectus, it states that the maximum allowable return if held to maturity is 7.51%. The minimum potential return if held to maturity is 0%. And it is based on the change in the level of the TSX 60 index. So the change in, in the level is the price index and excludes dividends. The price level from October 20th, 2010 to October 20th, 17, the return was 3.68% annualized. The total return was 6.78%. So the difference or the cost of that guarantee was 3.1%. So let's look at it compared to others. Your seven year annualized return on the PPN was 3.68. On the five year GIC, if you'd just been investing in five year GICs, over that seven year period, you would have had an annualized return of 1.63%. As I already noted, the composite 